down the long path of history, tramping across centuries and continents and the graves of kings and the necks of dictators, seeking always a way of life where the people have their freedom, believing, praying, fighting, dying, we came this way. The NBC University of the Air, a public service feature of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations, presents We Came This Way a new historical series for our listeners at home and overseas. With Clifton Utley as narrator, we present Chapter 5, the story of Alexander Herzen and his fight against tyranny in We Came This Way. Conspiracy against his imperial majesty, the Tsar, for treasonous action against the government. You shall be hung by the neck until you are dead. One hundred lashes to be delivered upon the naked back by order of his majesty, the Tsar. These peasants must be whipped regularly, otherwise they will enjoy their leisure too much. Is the lashing whip a familiar sound to you? <coughs> Is a scream of pain and the groan before the fainting a part of your liberal education? Or do you look upon them merely as the symbols of ancient tyranny? As long as we take the common people as clay, and ourselves as the sculptors, and from our sublime heights, mold it into a statue... Have you ever sat in your room writing a thesis on the freedom of men, and then and suddenly heard a sound, passes. and wrote the last sentence, walked down the stairs, and opened the door carefully, and faced the grim faces and official uniforms of the police, and had them tell you... You will come with us. You are under arrest. And have you ever put on your hat and coat, followed the police out into the street without a word of protest, not knowing whether you would ever again return home? Climb into this coach. Driver, the office of the commissar. That man in the coat, sitting between those two policemen, is Alexander Herzen. He's an aristocrat. Hard to believe now. His father's a rich man who owns a lot of serfs, but that won't help the matter any now. He's suspected of conspiracy against the Tsar, and the Tsar is a tyrant who knows no mercy. Have you ever wondered where a man's fight against tyranny begins? Must one be born with the desire of a free world and a free humanity? Or is it something learned through experience and observation? Alexander Herzen was subjected to the evidence early in his life. Allow me to present, as Herzen himself saw at a tender age of nine, the brief case history of one Polichanov, the serf, the victim of a monarchical system and tyrannical rule. The streets of Moscow are crisp with white snow. Carriages crunch through the imperial city. The festive spirit hangs in the air. While quietly, in front of a blazing fire, sits Vladimir Herzen and his son, Alexander. The visitor is a tall young man, grim-faced, glassy-eyed, and obviously drunk. Good evening, Vladimir. What do you want, Telechanov? Is the senator here? 
the senator is Vladimir's brother, a man who has gone out of his way to send Tolachanov through medical school. No, the senator is not here. Maybe later. That's too bad. I don't think that I will be here later. You are drunk, Telechanov. Better go upstairs and sleep it off. This time I shall not be able to sleep it off. Has the senator told you anything about large amounts of money missing from his house? I know. He hasn't. When he comes, tell him that I'm the thief. This is the last straw. Are you allowing yourself to go completely to pieces because some confounded woman did some... That is a peculiar problem, Vladimir. I wonder whether it is Olga... Or whether it's the fact that I am only a serf. Well, where is Olga now? Have you tried to get in touch with her? I don't know where she is. And since she left me, I don't care to know either. It was your own fault. When you got married, you should have told her that you were only a serf and not go on pretending that you were... It was my mistake only for thinking it was true love. Sleep it off. We'll talk some more in the morning. I'll be asleep. Soon enough. For a long, long time. Before I came here tonight, I... Swallowed half a glass full of poison. Here, here, drink this milk the doctor gave you. It will make you throw up the poison. Oh, no. That would only mean I'd have to take it all over again. How oh, it burns. How oh, it burns. Fire in my stomach. Better send for a priest, Doctor. I don't want a priest. I know too much anatomy to believe there's a life beyond the grave. What time is it? Almost midnight. The new year is practically upon us. I am the daughter of an officer, she said to me. I would stay married to you if you were not a serf. But there's too much of a difference between us. <laughs> Those were her words. <laughs> New Year, year, 1822, a new year, happy new year, to all of you, happy, <laughs> And there lies Tolachanov. His face black and distorted. His whole body twisted grotesquely. While the new year is being proclaimed throughout the land, and young Alexander sees death for the first time. And although he yet does not understand the meaning of it or its cause, the case history of Tolachanov, the serf, is stored away in his mind to emerge years later as evidence in his fight against tyranny. There are other things, too. Insignificant details at the time that build up an attitude, an unconscious feeling. Whenever his father whips him, which happens at least once a week, it is not the parental prerogative which angers the boy as much as the caustic statements of his governess. Don't complain to me whenever they lay their birch rod to you. Don't come to me and call your father a tyrant. Soon enough, you will be grown up too, and you'll be just such a master yourself. It is the comparison which hurts, not the birch rod. And the child comprehends vaguely that there is a dim connection between tyranny and the death of Tolachanov. Alexander Herzen steps out of the coach, followed by the two policemen who escort him into the office of the commissar. The commissar is a young man, filled with his own importance and that of his job. He leans his jaw on folded hands and scrutinizes Herzen carefully. So, you are Alexander Herzen. I am. It has been my misfortune to have read some of your pamphlets. Meeting their author is a distinct disappointment. If the commissar is expecting anger to flit across Herzen's face, he is disappointed again, for Alexander does not change expression. Uh, tell me, Herzen, do you know of the existence of any secret societies? I do not. Do you take me for a fool? You, a student of the Moscow University, that breeding ground for revolutionaries, and you don't know of any societies? I've given answer. I suppose you don't even belong to any literary clubs, eh? I do not. Do you belong to any sort of society? No. <laughs> what fantastic tales you fellows can tell. Yeah, take him away. I'll let somebody else question him further at a future date. <laughs> Thank you.
And so Alexander Herzen is thrown into a cell, left alone to contemplate his sins. But are they sins? Was it a sin for him to study at the Moscow University? Was it a sin for him to meet there the most brilliant young student who accosted him in the hallway of the university on the very first day, stretching out his hand to him, saying, You're Alexander Herzen, aren't you? I'm Argarayev. Always make it a point to meet all the new students and set them right at the very beginning. You are now in the center of intellectual Russian life. You will find us here like nothing else in all of Russia. The students here give free vent to all of their expressions without any approval or official sanction. Alexander didn't even receive a chance for any comment. We don't suffer from any of the political restrictions you find so commonplace everywhere else in Russia. Of course, the, the police watch us very carefully, very carefully. And every now and then someone is arrested and sent to Siberia, but I know that you'll find it well worth your while here. You will like it, Alexander. I'm positive. These things could hardly be classified as sin, could hardly be called criminal for they did nothing but clarify in his mind the meanings of the words serfdom and tyranny and made him understand the serf who had died on the expensive rug on the floor of his own house. But you must join one of our societies, Alexander. When are you going to stop persecuting me, Ogoraev? You're much too intelligent. You write much too well. I can't allow you to waste your talent. Look, I can't hold with the doctrines of either society. Karl Marx with his the individual must be absorbed by society. A lot of humbug. All right, all right. But the fact is... And that... Max Turner and his individualism means absolute freedom for everyone. And don't you believe Let in... me finish, let me finish. To carry out the wishes and desires uncontrolled by society and reason. These Why, two really argue. Two fiery youths filled with the knowledge that the world is evil. Filled with the desire to make it better. Never, Disagreeing never, on the method, just... not the theory. Oh, That's why I stick to Hegel. I tell you, Russia's salvation lies in the pursuit of lines toward the West. There is no people in the world more capable of absorbing and incorporating foreign ideas and at the same time retaining their own peculiar characteristics. Now, just take... Alexander. Well? Disagree all you want to. We need the moral support of members to hold us together. After all, we're all just fighting for some form of socialism or social democracy, if you so want it. I see what you mean. And besides, arguments strengthen the powers of reasoning. I'll join with you. Just remember, politics interest me only insofar as they seem to promise deliverance to suffering humanity. To me, socialism is only essential insofar as it is conducted to that end. He joined the circle of Stankiewicz. A few of his pamphlets are published. If not famous, Alexander at least becomes notorious and soon, as you remember, arrested, thrown into a cell, awaiting his second interview. This time it's a magistrate who asks the questions. <clears throat> I see that you are here on account of that Stankiewicz affair. The magistrate is an old man with a long white beard and a kindly twinkle in his eyes. He glances at the reports on his desk and then smiles down at Alexander. I'm not too familiar with the society, having only heard uh, rumors, which are, of course, not reliable. Your Honor, I've been a prisoner now for more than a fortnight. I know nothing of the charges that are brought against me. That's right. That's right. Continue using just that line. You must not know anything. You understand? Anything. But it's not a line. Young it's... man, would you allow me to give you some advice? Well, yes, certainly. You're young. Your blood is hot. You easily grow angry, and that, I'm afraid, would be both unfortunate and uh, unwise. Just remember, you must not know anything about anything. You understand? Well, yes, I do, but... But what? Why are you giving me this advice? The magistrate pauses for a long moment, and then, carefully looking around to all sides to make sure he's not being observed... He leans closer to Alexander and whispers, Many years ago, I was myself a student at the Moscow University. Another five days pass, and then... 
A smooth-faced young man enters the cell, removes some papers from a portfolio, adjusts a pair of pince-nez to his crooked nose, wheezes a tubercular <laughs> cough, hiding his mouth with the back of his hand, and stares at Herzen. It's evident, of course. You have acted and participated in actions designed against the government. True or false? False. True, it must be true. What do you think you're being locked up for, hmm? Stupid peasant. <coughs> now, in order to make it possible for us to implore the pardon of... Uh, a pardon? For me? Why? I am here to state the facts and go about my business. And not to answer all and every silly question you can manufacture. All right, all right, go ahead. I understand the general idea. Continue. What general idea? That to exile me to Siberia or to some heaven-forsaken place is to make a martyr out of me. It would increase my popularity. That is dangerous. But to pardon me and keep the secret police constantly on my neck is Neither. a bird of... Neither am I here to exchange random observations with you. Now, to return to the pardon. To make it go through, we must have proof of your repentance. And how will that be accomplished? I have the papers all prepared. They are addressed to the commission in words quite simple and sincere. And what does this masterpiece state? I would thank you to keep your opinions to yourself alone here. <coughs> and the letter is a full confession, stating simply that you allowed yourself to be led astray because of your youth. And that... My youth? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> what else does the letter say? There are, in addition to the confession, a few blank spaces. Blank spaces? For you to fill out. Fill out with what? With the names of those individuals who took advantage of your youth. Who led you astray? Simple, isn't it? You want me to turn informer? I am not here. Yes, 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 I know. Is there anything else? Uh, uh, no, just the names. Uh, I brought a pen and ink with me. Will you sign now and fill in? I will fill in nothing. Nothing? Now or ever. Do you mean to say that you will choose to stand trial uh, rather than take this opportunity of... Of the, turning uh, myself into a traitor against my comrades? Yes. You don't have to be kind to me because I was born an aristocrat. I am a human being, just the same as the peasants whose interests I am trying to fight for. I shall stand trial, and I shall not sign any confession or supply you with any names. It is not Alexander Herzen so much who is on trial, but his spirit, his will, his sincerity and his determination. They are on trial. And thus, Herzen is transferred to Moscow to await sentence. He is thrown into a cell with other prisoners, and the first face he sees is a familiar one. The first hand he clasps, a friendly one. So, you are under arrest too, Ogoraev. And Ogoraev merely smiles and shrugs his shoulders. It is his way of acknowledging the inescapable. It doesn't take long for the two of them to be engaged once more in heated argumentation. Changes must be brought around by force. Force is the only way. Violent, sudden, decisive. No, no, you can't settle anything that way. It's the only way. You and your intellectual approach. We've been fighting against corporal punishment for 50 years. Think of it, Herzen, 50 years. And what have we accomplished? The fault with you, Ogoraev, the fault with all of your kind lies in your inherent romanticism. You look upon corrupt society and tyrannical rule as if it were a windmill, and you are Don Quixote, ready to engage it in action. Now, I grant you, you can clear away anything by force and prepare the space you make for building, but you cannot build up by force. Freedom, if we ever want to see it succeed, must come from the people themselves. They must know what they want and why they want it. They must understand. Unless they understand, the cause will never be successful. And if you don't believe me, then let me call in the American colonies as proof of my statement. Finally, the day of judgment arrives, and Alexander Herzen stands before the judge, who fixes his glasses, blows his nose, and reads the verdict. Alexander Herzen... It is the judgment of this court that you shall be admitted to the service of the state under the surveillance of the local magistrate. I have received the command of the Most High concerning you. It is left to me to choose the place of your exile and the post of service. You shall go to Vyatka as a civil 
employee of the government. Seven years he spends in Vyatka. Seven long, interminable years during which he is a model prisoner. Quiet, ruly, obedient. His only peculiarity lies in that he wanders through the city on occasion and stops to speak with the peasants. But what harm can there be in that? What can a peasant tell a man like Herzen? He took my husband, removed his shoes, and made him walk barefoot across a large sheet of iron that had been frosted to ten degrees. And why was that done to him? He was overheard making a criticism of the Tsar. Yes. What can a peasant tell a man like Herzen? And then a transfer comes through for Herzen, and he is sent to Vladimir. The city is larger, the field riper, the contacts easier, and Alexander Herzen is ready as he had never been before. My friend, I'm ready to begin the struggle in earnest indeed. My pen will be a sword, and its point shall pierce and dissect all tyranny. Herzen becomes an influence in Russia that is a living force, and the circulation of his writings a vocation zealously pursued. Your Highness. Yes, yes, what is it? I have taken this opportunity of speaking first to you instead of to your father, the Tsar. All right. What is on your mind? Uh, do you remember, sir, a man by the name of Alexander Herzen? Herzen? Of course I do. A very brilliant man. Uh, very. I believe you met him personally in Vyatka, didn't you? If you mean whether it was I who had him transferred here to Vladimir, it was. Thank you. I thought as much. Uh, that's why I came to you direct. I think it is time that these books were brought to your attention. Books? I have them with me here. Uh, this one. Baptized property. <laughs> A violent essay attacking serfdom. Mm, interesting. Quite. And this one. Whose fault? Uh, very much the same as the other. Mm, written by Alexander Hetson, I suppose. Uh, yes. Anything else? The most reliable agents of the secret police have reported to me that Alexander Herzen is the leader of the new Westerners party that has sprung up. Hmm, he's forcing our hand, isn't he? Uh, quite, sir. Has he made any requests yet for a passport out of Russia? Uh, he has mentioned, uh, at times, a desire to go to France with his wife and children. You will grant him that request? Uh, grant the request. There's nothing he can do in foreign countries except to continue writing these books. Our customs officials will be able to control the distribution of them here in Russia. It is the wisest thing which we can do. That should be enough to break the will of Alexander Herzen. That should be sufficient to quell his spirit and still his violent tongue. That's what they thought. How long can a man fight against insurmountable obstacles? How long will a man batter his bleeding hands against a door that will not open? Do you hear that? Those are printing presses. Not as modern as the ones we have today, but sufficient for their purpose. They are printing books. Books about tyranny and freedom. All freedoms. Books exposing the inhumanity of man to men. Books appealing to the mind and the heart. Books that were seeded by a plant called truth. Why don't you give up, Alexander? For three years now, your free Russian press here in London has been printing these books, and not only without selling a single copy, but with scarcely being able to get a copy of them introduced into Russia. That was a common man speaking, a printer by profession, a half-hearted revolutionary by his own choice, a man who is willing to call it quits when the going gets too tough. I have been printing books for three years. Tyranny has reigned for a few thousand years. It's only logical that I cannot break so well implanted a tradition overnight. That was a patriot speaking, a man forced to flee his native land, a man who sees in the struggles of the people of Russia, the struggles of all mankind, a man who realizes that all action must be preceded by thought, that the flower, too, was once only a seed. Mm -hmm. 
A letter from Ogoroyev showed him how patience and determination find their own reward. My dear Alexander, now that the Tsar is dead and his son has taken reign, we have managed to smuggle more and more copies of your books into Russia. I must now admit to you that you were right. Your books are doing wonders here. You've become a cult. You are the guiding spirit now of every society here. Continue to write, Alexander. I think our victorious end is in sight. And the presses continue to turn out the pages of the determination second only to that of the man Herzen himself. Can anyone dare to declare either that the past contains nothing beautiful or that there is not much worth preserving? The judgment of the world has arrived. You cannot save it by martial laws or by philanthropy or by distributing land. And we see him standing here now, watching the thumping presses and smiling as the wet pages slip out of the rollers one by one. We see that Herzen is really a tired man, tired beyond the endurance of man. Within a month, he'll return to Paris. His chest will be inflamed. It will become a battlefield of pain, and Herzen, the man, will die. But only the mortal part of him will pass on. His words will live on signposts, showing the way he came guiding others in the way to follow. The NBC University of the Air has brought you Chapter 5 in the new historical series, We Came This Way. Next week, we Came This Way will present Garibaldi, hero of two worlds. Alexander Herzen is just one of the 13 great world fighters whose life stories are told in the handbook, We Came This Way. This interesting booklet has been specially prepared to provide a permanent record of the series and to give additional information concerning the lives and times of the men portrayed on these programs. To obtain your copy, send 25 cents in coin for We Came This Way handbook to Columbia University Press, Station J, New York, 27. Tonight's script was written by Guy Debris and was directed by Homer Heck. The original music was composed by Emil Soderstrom and conducted by Joseph Galicchio. Members of the cast included Clifton Utley as narrator and Willard Waterman as Herzen. Others in the cast were Eleanor Engel, William Everett, James Goss, Wilms Herbert, Sidney Mason, Tom Post, and Fred Sullivan. This series is presented each week as a public service feature of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent station. This is the National Broadcasting Company.